Hi, this is Linda Green talking about section 14.2, limits and continuity. In this section, we'll give some formal definitions of limits, which we actually won't really use much. We'll use, give some informal definitions of limits, which we'll use a lot, and we'll talk a little bit about continuity. So first, in Calculus 1, if you did delta epsilon definitions of limits, you might remember that the limit as x goes to a of a function is l if for every small number epsilon greater than zero there's a number delta greater than zero so whenever x is within delta of a the number x is approaching f of x has to be within epsilon of l the number it's approaching if you didn't do epsilon delta proofs in definitions in calculus one don't worry about it too much i'll state a similar definition for functions of two variables, but we won't do much with it. So what we will do is use more informal definitions, like the informal definition in calculus one, that the limit as x approaches a of f of x is l. If the function f gets closer and closer to the same number l when x approaches a either from the left or from the right. So take a moment and decide whether the limit of f of x exists for these functions, these four functions, as x approaches zero. You can pause the video. So hopefully you said that the limit does exist for this figure here. It does not exist for these two figures. For this figure, either answer is okay. Technically the limit does not exist because the function approaches infinity which is not a finite number L, but it's correct also to say that the limit as x goes to zero of f of x equals infinity. Um, you just need a slightly different idea of limit. Let me point out in particular that in this example, the limit doesn't exist because the limit from the left and the limit from the right are approaching two different values, negative one and one. You might also remember from calculus one that a function f is called continuous at the point x equals a if f of a exists, the limit as x goes to a of f of x exists, and the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals that function's value. And finally, you might remember some common functions that are continuous include polynomials, rational functions like 3x plus 2 over x squared minus 1. Polynomials are continuous everywhere. Rational functions are continuous on their domains. i.e. where the denominator is not zero. In addition, if you take sums, differences, products, quotients, and compositions of continuous functions, those are also continuous. Um, you have to be a little careful when you take the quotients that you don't divide by zero. As an example, if you have a function like sine of uh, the square root of 3x minus 2, that's a composition of a polynomial, a square root, and a sine function, which are all continuous on their domains, so this is continuous on its domain. Okay. So for two functions of two variables, a lot of the ideas and definitions are very similar. Common functions that are continuous include all the same things. Polynomials, which are now things that can have several variables in them, 
rational functions, which are quotients of polynomials on their domains, where the denominator is not zero, and sums, differences, products, quotients, and compositions of continuous functions. Again, being careful that the denominator is not zero. The definition of continuity, a function f of x, y is continuous at the point x, y equals a, b if, just like for functions of one variable, the function has to have a value, it has to exist at that point a, b. The limit as x, y goes to a, b of f of x, y has to exist. And the limit of the function has to equal its value. Now you might be wondering what does it really mean for the limit of a function of two variables to exist? And that's what we'll talk about next. So again, there's a formal definition for a limit to exist. For a function f of two variables and a point a, b, the limit as x, y goes to a, b of f of x, y is equal to l means formally that for every number epsilon greater than zero, there's a corresponding number delta greater than zero such that whenever x, y is within a distance of delta from a, b, f of x, y will be within epsilon of L. As a picture, what this means is that if I have a little chunk of the x, y plane here, and here's my point a, b, I can think of the graph of my function as a surface living above the xy plane. Maybe here's my point f of a, b. My z axis is running this way. If I want to get within epsilon of my proposed limit l, I need to always be able to find a disk of radius delta for some little delta so that whenever x is within this tiny disk around AB, my surface will be trapped within this interval of width to epsilon around L. No matter how small I make epsilon, no matter how tightly I want to trap my surface, I can always find a tiny enough disk so that all points will be trapped within that interval. So making this even a little more formal, what I can say is to say that x, y is within distance delta from a, b, that means whenever the square root of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared is less than delta, that just means distance or a disk of radius delta, f of x, y is within epsilon of L. Since f of x, y is just a single real number, its distance is represented with an absolute value. Okay, that's all for the formal definition, which I wanted you to see so that you'll be a little bit more familiar with it if you take further classes like mathematical analysis, advanced calculus that use this sort of definition. But we'll actually, in, for practical purposes, use a more informal definition that's similar to the idea in Calculus 1 that you need to approach your limit from both sides and get the same limit. So informally, limit as x, y goes to a, b of f of x, y equals l means that f of x, y approaches l when x, y approaches a, b along any path towards a, b. So 
in one dimension, x could just approach a from two directions, from the left and from the right. But in two dimensions, we have many options for approaching AB. We can approach it from any direction, and we can also approach it along curvy and wiggly paths. And for the limit to exist and equal L, we need to be able to approach the same number L no matter how we approach the point AB. I want to spend a few minutes allowing you to build your intuition for limits by looking at some graphs. So here I have four functions that I've graphed on MatGrapher. And for each of them, I want you to think about whether the limit exists as x, y approaches 0, 0. Now, the MatGrapher couldn't graph a lot of these right around 0, 0, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the limit doesn't exist. The MatGrapher is not perfect. Notice that the, I colored these according to height so that the red parts of the surface have a higher z value and the blue parts of the surface have a lower z value. Now pause the video for a moment and try to decide if these limits exist as x, y goes to 0, 0. So hopefully you decided that the limit does exist for B and D, but does not exist for A and C. For A, the problem is, as I approach along the x-axis, I'm in a red part of the region which is high, and so I'm approaching a higher limit than when I approach along the y-axis. So as I approach from two different directions, I'm getting two different limits, and so the limit does not exist. For part C, it's even easier as I approach in the x, along the x-axis from positive x to 0, I'm going up to, looks like negative infinity or some high value. When I approach along the x-axis uh, using negative x values, I'm going down to negative infinity or at least some negative value. So the limit doesn't exist. Here, there's nothing special going on. It's pretty clear that as you go along any path towards 0, 0, you're hitting the same value, same limit. And here, even though MatGrapher couldn't graph it, see it's pretty clear from the coloring that no matter what path you approach along, you're coming to the same height, the same limit. This was just an intuitive idea of limits based on graphs. For practical purposes, when we're actually going to demonstrate that a limit exists mathematically, first of all, the best way to show that a limit does not exist is to find two different paths so that f of x, y goes to one limit, L1, along one path. These are paths to AB. And f of x, y approaches some different limit along the second path to AB. Common paths to choose are paths along the x-axis the y-axis, uh, straight lines like x equals y, but sometimes in order to find paths to show that a limit doesn't exist, you'll have to use other paths like we'll see an example coming up. For practical purposes, the best way to show that a limit does exist is to either use continuity for continuous functions, they always have limits that exist as long as the point's in their domain. Another way to show that a limit exists is to use polar coordinates. And we'll do an example like this. Whoops, y equals r sine theta. If you're not familiar with polar coordinates, you can review them in section 10.3. It's also possible to at least convince yourself that a limit exists by approaching A, B along many paths and verifying that you always get the same limit, but this does not prove that the limit exists.
And you can never check infinitely many. You can never check all the paths. There are infinitely many. So you need to stick with one of these methods or using the epsilon delta definition, which you probably want to avoid if you can. Okay, so our first example is to show that this limit does not exist. Now, I mentioned a good path to try first might be a path along the x-axis. So this, that would be a path that looks like t0, where t approaches 0, since we want to approach the point 0, 0. And if I look at my function at points of the form t0, that's going to give me 2 times t times 0 over t squared plus 0 squared, which is just 0. And so that clearly approaches 0 as t goes to 0. So the limit along the x-axis is just 0. If I look along the y-axis, those will be the points of the form 0t as t approaches 0. And my function is again going to be 0 along the y-axis. So far, the two paths I've shown have the same limit of 0. If I try instead the path y equals x, so those are points of the form tt as t goes to 0, f of tt is going to look like 2 times t times t over t squared plus t squared, which is 2t squared over 2t squared, which is 1, which does not approach 0. It just approaches 1 as t goes to 0. And since 1 is not equal to 0, we know that the limit does not exist. We found a path, or two paths, that give different limits as we approach 0, 0 along those two paths, and so the limit can't exist. Notice from the picture we can see that along the line y equals x, the function appears higher than it does along the x-axis. And I bet if we use the line y equals negative x, we'd get a limit that was even lower, something like negative 1. For our next example, you can check that approaching along the x-axis or the y-axis, those will always give us a value of 0 on the numerator and something not 0 on the denominator. Well, some t's will still be on the denominator. Anyway, if you can check that if you approach along the x-axis or the y-axis, you will get a limit of 0. And if I approach along the line y equals x, or in fact along any line y equals mx for a slope m, let's just do all these lines at once, then I'm going to be approaching along points, lines that look like t m t, where m is just a constant, right, giving our slope that we're approaching along. Let me draw a picture here. So we're approaching 0, 0 along some line of slope m. Okay, so f of t m t is going to be t times m squared t squared over t squared plus m to the fourth t to the fourth. If I factor out a t squared from the top and the bottom, I get m squared t over 1 plus m to the fourth t to the fourth. And as t goes to 0 and I approach that point zero, zero. Whoops. I'm just going to get zero on the top and one on the bottom, so that's just going to be zero. So as I approach along any straight line of any slope, I'm getting a limit of zero. You might think the limit of this function is going to be zero, but if you look at the graph, there's something a little crazy going on on these parabola-shaped pieces. It seems like it has a ridge, a high ridge and a low ridge along these parabolas. So let's use the curve x equals y squared, that parabola there. In other words, let's use points to the form 
t squared t as t goes to zero. And if we look at the function at t squared t, that's going to be t squared times t squared over t squared squared plus t to the fourth. So that's t to the fourth over t to the fourth plus t to the fourth, which is one half. So as we approach along this curve, we're getting a limit of one half and not zero. The limit does not exist. I have two examples that I want to do where the limit does exist. So in this example, it's pretty easy to see that the limit exists because this is a rational function and in this case, unlike the others, the point we're approaching does not make the denominator zero. So since f of x, y is rational and zero, zero is in its domain, doesn't make the denominator zero, we know that the limit as x, y goes to zero, zero of f of x, y is just f of zero, zero, which is 1 over 1 or 1. Right? Any continuous function, the, for any continuous function as you approach a point in its domain, the function itself just approaches its value and the limit exists. For our last example, I'm going to show that this limit here does exist. So our intuition based on the graph is that it does exist. I'd like to, but here the point zero, zero is not in the domain of the rational function. It makes the denominator zero, so I can't just appeal to continuity. Instead, I want to use polar coordinates and let x equal our cosine theta and y equals our sine theta. As a picture here, what's happening as I approach zero, zero I'm thinking of, I'm going to think of the path as having a, an r that depends on time and a theta that depends on time. Theta might be wiggling all over, but my r is going to be going to zero as I approach this point, zero, zero. So if I rewrite this function in polar coordinates, I have 3 r squared cosine squared theta for x squared, and I have r sine theta for y minus 3 r squared cosine squared theta minus 3 r squared sine squared theta. Divide that by r squared cosine squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta. And now if I simplify, um, on the denominator here, I'm just going to get r squared, since cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. Up here, I can also simplify this piece to a negative r squared, 3r squared. And this piece I'll write as 3r cubed cosine squared theta sine theta. Now I can pull out an r squared and rewrite this as r squared times 3r cosine squared theta sine theta minus 3 over r squared, which is just 3r cosine squared theta sine theta minus 3. And since my path is approaching the point 0, 0, my r is approaching 0. Since my cosine theta and sine theta are bounded, this limit here is just going to be negative 3. And so the limit of my function as I approach 0, 0 exists and equals negative 3. Now on your homework, you'll have to not only verify that limits do or do not exist using these methods, but you also first have to decide which one you're going for. Does the limit exist or does it not exist? And to help you decide that, 
you can build up evidence by looking along various paths, like the x-axis, the y-axis. You can look for continuity, if that helps. If the point that you're going approaching is in the domain, you can use continuity. And you can also use graphs to build your intuition and help you decide what paths to try based on what the graphs look like if you're trying to show the limit doesn't exist. That's all. See you in class.